Um, I'll go ahead and um, um, do the honors of introducing our speakers. So first of all, um, a very warm welcome everyone to, uh, to the first bi-weekly research meetup that is um, uh, being co-organized by the Path Check uh, Foundation, uh, an MIT spin-off, um, and, uh, and also Tav Lab at IIIT Delhi. We are very excited to have an illustrious uh, panel of three speakers with us today. And the idea of these meetings is to kick off uh, a discussion on um, tools for, uh, for, for improving public, pu public health uh, in the current COVID scenario. So we are going to be discussing about AI for public health, digital tools for vaccinations, privacy concerns, equitable vaccine distribution, and more. So this is um, a follow-up of the conferences that the, uh, uh, the Pacek Foundation has been holding um, along with, uh, and the details can be found at pandemic.mit.edu. So with that, I, um, I welcome all the three illustrious speakers. I'll just introduce the first speaker uh, now, uh, Dr. Christine Glorioso. So Dr. Christine Glorioso is a computational neurobiologist. Um, she's a physician, she's an MD, PhD. And she is the founder of the Science Advocacy nonprofit called Academics for the Future of Science. It was created um, um, by the early career scientists at MIT 2013. And uh, uh, Dr. Kristin is very much uh, embedded into advancing COVID solutions uh, and also playing um, um, the role of advocacy and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and proposing solutions that are computational and um, a bridge uh, public health and computation. So thank you so much, Christine, for joining us. And um, uh, the stage is all yours. You can go ahead and present. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And, and thanks for having me here. I, I'm really so excited to be presenting um, and excited about all the great work that PathCheck is doing and, and to be a part of it um, currently. So I, I will share my screen. I have some slides. Okay. Um, so the title of my talk today is Predictive Modeling of COVID-19 and Conveying Reliable Information to the Public. Um, so 2020, like for many of us, has been quite the journey for me, um, both in terms of uh, modeling the pandemic and also in terms of the work I've done with my nonprofit. Um, in trying to convey reliable information to the public. Um, so I'm gonna start at uh, the end actually on how I know um, PathCheck, uh, who I've only come to uh, appreciate or, or get to know in the last couple of weeks um, in March and February. And I know PathCheck through the X Prize competition which started in November and ended quite recently. Um, and this was a competition uh, called the Pandemic Response Comp Challenge that was using AI and predictor models both to um, predict uh, COVID-19 cases and also to try to create better interventions for uh, minimizing both cases and economic damage uh, through these non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as school closing, workplace closing, public events, um, these kind of things, to, to take a more uh, fine fine tooth comb to um, interventions that countries could do that would be uh, overall for the public good. And this is my model. So this is my model as of the end of the contest. Um, so. In, in blue uh, is, is my predicted model that I submitted December 20th um, and it didn't have access to the internet and I, I couldn't touch it. I still haven't touched this model. Um, and you can see that for more than nine weeks, it was very accurate in predicting COVID-19 cases all, all the way until end of February. Um, and it predicted the Christmas and New Year's spikes very well and uh, the peak of cases um, and the slope in which they would uh, descend. And, and this was valuable because I was able to communicate this to my 
followers on my nonprofit page and into my own personal friends and family to give them a better idea of um, the course of uh, the pandemic. And so my, this is the top 10 teams from XPRIZE just for the US. Um, and my model ended up being the uh, top model in the US as a predictor. And so now I'm gonna back up and tell you a little bit about me and how I came to be in the XPRIZE modeling COVID-19 cases. Um, so I, as, as was mentioned in the kind introduction, I'm an MD-PhD. Um, after the MD PhD program that I completed, I came to MIT as a postdoc uh, in the biology department to spearhead this big multi uh, institutional project, uh, predicted, uh, doing predictive modeling of a different type, type for cognitive, cognitive resilience and Alzheimer's disease using uh, genetics and transcriptomics in these large uh, human cohorts. And it turns out that the uh, skills involved with Alzheimer's disease modeling are not too terribly different from the uh, 19 uh, predicted modeling. Um, also, as my time, as was mentioned, my during my time as a postdoc, I was uh, founded a science advocacy nonprofit called Academics for the Future of Science. It was run by postdocs and graduate students at MIT and across the Boston area and the country. Um, so we were a partner with the National March for Science, and this is just some pictures um, from that, and, and also the Boston March for Science. And um, this was in DC. And, and we also hosted a big um, science advocacy seminar and workshop um, at MIT in 2016. We had Rush Holt, who was a former congressman and was the then CEO of AAAS as our keynote. And we had students and, and postdocs from across the country um, learning about how to advocate better for science. And we also did outreach with the community. So this is AFS at the Cambridge Robot Zoo working with kids and, and teaching them about science. Um, so on the left, uh, the man in the, in the short white coat uh, who was a med student at the time is my best friend. Um, Mark Doyle, my roommate in graduate school. Um, he was at the March for Science with us. He, uh, uh, in February of 2020, so a year ago, he was uh, an emergency room physician at, uh, in Detroit, preparing for the COVID, upcoming COVID-19 crisis. And so this was the first part of information that I had that was different than the public. I got a phone call from Mark, who is one of the calmest um, people that I know, um, absolutely speaking in terms of this was gonna be a giant crisis. And, and this is not the information that the public got. So I started looking at the data, naturally being a data scientist, um, kind of can't help myself in that regard. And in uh, March, 2021, I was comparing the slope of the curve in Italy of cases going up, which Italy was already in crisis, to the slope in New York. Um, and I was very worried about my friends and family in New York. And I was uh, asking them, this is one of the very first posts I made, to shelter in place, even though there wasn't that order. At the same time, I also knew that in an unprecedented manner, Harvard and MIT had shut down their campuses and uh, evacuated all the students. That's not something that Harvard or MIT would do lightly. Um, that's never happened in their history. So I knew this was a really big deal, but what the news was saying was telling a different story. So from our president at the time, you know, just stay calm, it will go away. Um, even in, but you know, most of my immediate Facebook circles are highly educated, progressive people. I was surprised we getting pushed back from them. I had people were arguing with me a lot about this. And one of the most cited things was the, these cases aren't real, we're just testing more. And that information was even printed in Newsweek magazine. Um, so the misinformation was coming from all sides. Uh, and that was very frightening to me because I knew people were not gonna take this seriously. They were gonna still be at work. They were gonna still be on subways. Um, 
So fast forward a couple months to reopening. So we ended up locking down. Uh, of course, cases were terrible in New York and, and a lot more people died than needed to. Um, and uh, the next piece of misinformation rolled in, which was uh, the virus is gonna go away with heat. Um, I again scratched my head, where is this information going from? Of course, it's being spread by politicians such as Donald Trump. Um, and uh, you can see that not only did it not go away, away with heat, but some of the southernmost states were hit the hardest. So states like Texas, Florida, really hot states were hit during reopening. Um, and so I was just trying to get basic public health information out to people. Um, in the US, uh, people didn't know who was high risk or not. Um, basic things like just wear a mask, wash your hands, leave the windows open. This was information that I was getting a ton of pushback on, even as late as June of 2020. And my friend Nina, who works with me at AFS and created this infographic, I asked her, she's now living in the Ukraine, I asked her if this would be helpful in the Ukraine and she said, no, our, our population already knows all of this in the Ukraine. This would not be something they would bat an eye at because this has been, this information has been readily distributed. So that was very interesting and telling to me that the public here in the US was so um, uninformed. Um, and then several more events happened tragically uh, you can see North and South Dakota are lit up here. That is from the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, the 50,000 person motorcycle rally. Also schools opening contributed a lot in the fall. And then we had a bump from Thanksgiving, um, sort of over and over again, these unnecessary cases and deaths um, just due to precautions not being taken. And I think with Thanksgiving in the airports, you know, better air filtration, mask wearing, distancing would have made all the difference in not creating that bump. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out in this map, which is from October, 2020, um, getting a little bit more into the science here, is you can see this pattern emerging where the coastal areas um, have less cases. So this is daily new cases per million than the interior. And the reason for that actually is immunity. So the the exterior of the US got COVID first. In a sense, they were on a different uh, pandemic trajectory. Their pandemic started earlier um, due to travel in from uh, airplanes. Okay, so how was I able to predict these, these spikes? And, and how did I know what was going on? Well, um, in the US, herd immunity became a, uh, dirty word, but it's actually just a basic part of an SIR compartmental model, which is a classical epidemiological model, which is part of my model. So in yellow, you have uh, susceptible individuals and they um, decrease over time. In, in this teal color, you have recovered individuals. So those are individuals who have become immune from previous infection. And in, in the middle is, the, is what we're trying to minimize, which is infectious cases. We want the cases to go down. Um, and uh, between these compartments are um, uh, rates of, of change. And these are all described by differential equations. And between susceptible and infectious individuals, there is this very important parameter called beta. Um, if I can, this is a little bit in my way. Okay, so so beta uh, is the average number of, of contacts that an individual uh, comes in contact with per day, multiplied by the probability of transmission between contacts, an infectious subject and a susceptible subject. So this in a practical sense means if you are walking around um, and uh, you are someone who has not had COVID yet, what are the chances in that day that you are gonna encounter someone with COVID and that that person is gonna transmit it to you? Now, beta therefore is um, right in that definition. You can see where these guidelines come for social distancing and mask wearing because that would prevent if you ran into a person with COVID, them transmitting it to you. And 
the closures and in the small gatherings um, affect the number of contacts you come into come into contact with per day. Um, importantly, also COVID-19 is spread largely by super spreader events. And that's because super spreader events um, increase beta a lot because they increase both the likelihood that you're going to um, get COVID from someone infectious and also um, the number of people you're around. So air, so we know crowded indoor spaces, airplanes, universities, dorms, meatpacking plants, prisons. And I can see all of this in the data. The huge spikes in particular counties would all point me to some super spreader event or another. Okay, so how does this inform my model? So there are some um, innovations in my model, I think, that make it more accurate. For one thing, I, I told you about how all of the states are on a different trajectory and have a different um, timeline. So each state is considered separately for me um, as a separate SAR model. And then I sum over of them to get the US. So the US is not a single model. It is the sum of its parts. And I think that makes uh, <coughs> more accurate. Um, the parameters, so SAR modeling in general is very um, sensitive to having correct parameters. This is a big problem in places where testing isn't uh, ramped up because it's very hard to know the actual number of infectious re or recovered people. Um, this is also why downplaying testing or, or not being able to afford testing in a lot of places um, makes modeling so much more challenging. So the parameters adjusted are for asymptomatic cases. And I made those calculations based on serial prevalence and estimates of excess mortality. The next thing is beta is readjusted each day. So my beta is not static. It takes in um, policy. So if there are mask mandates, it can adjust beta for that. If there are school closures, it can adjust beta for that. Um, and then the last thing I think that was very important for this model is super spreader events. So I was able to use parameter adjustments from Thanksgiving to predict what would happen with Christmas and New Year's. So for Thanksgiving, which I also was able to accurately predict, which I didn't show you initially, um, I considered uh, increasing beta um, by a specific amount in each county in the US. That was like seeding those counties with COVID where they didn't have it before because people were traveling, particularly college students, back to houses um, and spreading COVID and starting their own SAR models in these places that had never had it before. And that's basically what happened uh, during Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And you can see how well those adjustments worked um, in terms of being able to predict these spikes. Okay. So this brings me to the present. So what are we dealing with now? So this is my model still untouched um, as of today or yesterday. Um, and uh, at the end of, end of February, now a few weeks ago, um, my model started to be less accurate and started to deviate from that curve. And I think this illustrates not only why it's good to have a, a very accurate predictive model, but also um, that it can let you know when things are not going as planned. Um, so I started immediately wondering why, why is my curve taking such a sharp uh, uh, left-hand turn here um, and leveling off? And, and a lot of people say, oh, it's still going down. That's fine. Like, we look fine. Maybe that's true, but, but also maybe not. Um, I began digging into the data a little bit, and I found that New York, um, and, and over on the right-hand side, I'm showing you this, um, is one of the, so New York is one of the most immune uh, states in the U United States. So on the bottom is the percent of state infected that I've estimated. Um, so I have New York at over 100% uh, previously infected or vaccinated. So they really should not have cases. And yet New York on the top graph uh, and the surrounding states has the most daily new cases adjusted for population of any state. This is concerning. Um, and I'm just showing you this in a little different view. So daily new cases as of today in New York on the top and daily new cases in New Jersey, uh, the next door state, you can see that they are not going down, they are leveled off 
New Jersey might even be going up a little bit for, for, the, for the amount of, of immunity those two states have, they should not look like this. And that is what's causing this deviation are these particular states. It's not all states, it's, it's these particular states surrounding New York. Um, and you can see Arkansas as a control is what all states would look like if there wasn't this deviation. And then in the bottom right, I'm showing you New York City. Um, and these are active cases per population. Uh, adjusted. So you can see that uh, in darkest blue has the most active cases. It really looks like this spread out from New York City of, of this. And um, so New York, and I, I, I didn't include this, this slide up for time, um, but the New York has a new mutation. There were a couple of preprints that came out of Columbia University and Caltech um, that is now greater than 27% of the cases in New York City are this new variant. This variant has um, more mutations than any of the other variants in the world. It's arguably the most dangerous because it has both the mutation that's seen that can escape antibody resistance in Brazil and the one in South Africa, as well as the ability to spread faster. Um, it's five different spike protein mutations. And, um, so in beginning to understand what this means for New York and what it means for the US um, in 2021, uh, I look to see where those, so it has the Brazil mutation and the South Africa mutation. So I look to see where, um, how those countries, countries that had those mutations were doing, particularly countries that should be immune at this point. And there's good news and bad news with that. Um, so in Brazil, the Brazil variant P1, so Brazil should have been uh, immune by infection. They should not be getting the way that they are. You can see that daily new cases um, have never been higher in Brazil. Um, even more disturbingly, the death rate uh, is the highest it's ever been. So it doesn't appear that previous infection um, is protecting Brazilians um, from being hospitalized or dying. Um, so this is very alarming for this variant. Um, however, there is some speculation that maybe these, and, and some evidence from early studies that maybe the vaccines are going to cover um, the variants better than previous infection. So then I look to Israel. Now Israel has the South African mutation um, is their biggest uh, variant of concern. And that is another one that the New York variant has. And they have a, a much more uh, promising story in terms of immunity. So they are now uh, completely immune, at least one shot with a Pfizer vaccine. And you can see that while cases haven't come completely down, the death rate is much, much lower. And they have prevented 97% of uh, serious cases of COVID with the Pfizer vaccine. So I think we need to just keep an eye on this. And this really speaks to the work that PathCheck is doing with variants, and with vaccine passports and, and how to incorporate um, which vaccine where and, and include the variants. And I think um, that's gonna be very important uh, for the future. And so the last, this is my last slide. So I just wanted to uh, show some take home points from my work with science advocacy. So in talking with the public and I, I, I wasn't able to show you anywhere near all of the, all of the things with that, um, also teaching, uh, undergrad course at, at BU on misinformation, these are some of the things I've learned about public communication. For one thing, um, behavior is well informed a lot by, by disparity. So we know in the US and in many, many countries, um, COVID-19 has not treated everyone equally. Uh, it's been worse for uh, women and families. It's been worse for people who are impoverished and it's been worse for people of color. So in the US alone, life expectancy in 2020 dropped less than a year for white men and six full years for black men. Um, and that is the thing we really need to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I've learned is that communicating with empathy and respect and not shaming um, was allowed, allowed me to reach across the aisle and really uh, talk to people and understand their stories, stories about you know, circumstances and, and, and how this pandemic isn't just about people behaving recklessly or not. It's also about essential workers, you know, 
being in harm's way and, and, and disparities. Uh, the next thing I learned is that trust is really important um, to avoid paternalism or oversimplification. People are smart that they're asking very hard math questions. They were seeing through when people were being paternalistic or, or, or oversimplifying the messaging. Um, I think the carrot should be used instead of the stick. A better public health message may have been wear a mask so your business can stay open. Not wear a mask or you're a bad person or you're reckless or you're trying to kill a grandmother. But you know, if you want uh, businesses open, if you want your kids in school, wearing a mask isn't gonna allow that to happen sooner and, and for those things to stay open. Um, and the last thing is the middle road is the one that can be traveled most safely. And I believe that this polarization of uh, super strict or um, you know, totally open, both of those approaches I think are wrong. And I think that there is a fine tuned middle path that would have allowed us to get through this pandemic and will allow us to get through future pandemics in a way that um, minimizes the harm better. So thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was a wonderful um, discussion talk. Uh, lots of exciting work that you presented and lots of take home messages. Uh, there are questions. Uh, but I think we will take all the questions in the Q&A session, so please keep your questions coming um, because there will be some uh, uh, questions that uh, I think all the three panelists can take. So up next is, um, um, is Professor Gautam Menon, um, again, somebody who's leading the modeling for the pandemic, uh, leading from the front in India. And uh, Gautam is a professor of physics and biology at Ashoka University. It's, uh, uh, it's in the northern part of the country. Um, and prior to joining Ashoka, he was a professor with the theoretical physics and computational biology groups at the Institute of Medi uh, Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. Uh, there he was the founding dean of the computational biology group. Um, and he has had numerous awards. I mean, in the Indian context, some of the most prestigious fellowships such as the Swaranjanti Fellowship, uh, fast track fellowship from the uh, Department of Science and Technology. But most importantly, Gautam has been a very proactive researcher and a communicator um, in the past one year. I've been following his research and uh, it's fascinating. So without further ado, I would like to um, uh, turn it over to um, Gautam. Please, uh, uh, please enlighten us with your models. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. And thank you, Kristen, for that nice introduction to the general subject. Um, so I take it that you can see my slides and you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about our work on thinking about vaccination policies for India. And this is something that is certainly a question of policy, but I want to talk about the models that might help inform that policy and really stick with models for most of this talk. So I want to give you a bird's eye view of all of the work that we've been doing models like the sort that Kristen was talking about, but a little more on the epidemiological model side as opposed to the AI ML side. I want to talk about compartmental models for vaccination strategies. I'll tell you about two models. One hasn't been repurposed yet to study vaccination, but that's something that we're very actively doing at the moment. I'm going to talk about network models that we began to work with to look at testing in India and how they can be repurposed for vaccinations. And then I want to tell you about a much larger project that's been going on for about the last eight or nine months which is called Bharat Sim, which is really a sort of granddaddy of the more type of model. It's an agent-based model. And the idea, the sort of ultimate idea would be to try and model every one of the 1.4 billion people in India at some level an agent on a computer. And the, the questions there are to, to try to understand what's the optimal amount of information you need to fold into an agent in order to be able to make credible or sensible predictions for how diseases might spread within that group of agents. So the first piece of work I want to tell you about is some work that came out recently on looking at vaccine allocation strategies in India. And this is a very canonical um, model of the type that Kristen described. It's not a simple SIR model. It has more compartments in it. It's age structure. So you're concerned about age groups, zero to 10 years, 10 to 20 years, because we know that COVID-19 hits different age groups different, very differently. So the chances of you're falling severely ill with COVID-19 in fact rises exponentially 
once you're above about 40 or 50 years. So we put that into this. We have we look at the sort of immunity that is guaranteed by vaccines. It can be sterilizing, it can be non-sterilizing, meaning that even that if you do, if you are vaccinated, but you do manage to catch COVID-19, then the question is, will you transfer it as efficiently to other people as if you were not vaccinated, etc.? That's the question that we can try and answer with these models. And then we look at models in which you can decide how you will distribute the vaccine. Will you initially vaccinate the old? Will you initially vaccinate the young people? Will you not care about ages at all, et cetera? These are questions that really models can answer and you should be able to go back to models and use them as references for what might be sensible public policy. So the model is there on the top left. There's a susceptible compartment, an exposed compartment, and that exposed compartment splits up into symptomatic and asymptomatic. And that's one unusual thing that we know now about COVID-19, that a very large fraction of people can be asymptomatic, can be infected and yet not show symptoms at all. In India, that number seems to be possibly in the region of 60 to 70 percent. The numbers are sort of smaller in the US and the UK populations. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Indian population is younger on average than the US population. The median age in India is about 29 years. The US is probably closer to a 40 or 41. So these are things that we can do if you do a proper age stratification of these, all of these rates in which you move between compartments depend upon how old you are. So you can go from these, this is fairly standard language of, of compartmental model, but look at the, at the bottom row, which tells you what happens when you take a susceptible person and vaccinate them. And they can be exposed and vaccinated, asymptomatic and vaccinated, etc. So the assumption is that you're not symptomatic or that the probability of being symptomatic, your vaccination is much reduced, but you can be asymptomatic. And that's where the question of, can you infect other people while being vaccinated and asymptomatic or not, comes into the discussion of sterilizing versus non-sterilizing immunity. So we've looked at strategies in which you distribute vaccines evenly across the population, or you give it first to 20 and 40, 20 to 40 year old, first to 40 to 60 year old, or first to greater than 60 years old. And it turns out that in these models, that the best thing that you can do is to give it to people who are elderly first. And we look at the, looking at the population structure of a number of different Indian states, look at contact matrices that are believed to be somewhat appropriate to India, and then we can do these calculations. These are the sorts of results of the calculation, the different levels of coverage of the population with sterilizing and non-sterilizing immunity. And strategy four turns out to lead to the largest reduction in the death overall. So it's best to, to vaccinate the elderly people and then shift to the younger people. That's what these models would also seem to suggest. And they also quantify there isn't much difference between sterilizing and non-sterilizing immunity provided by vaccine. And so this supports recommendations, including from the WHO to prioritize COVID-19 vaccine allocations for older adults. If you, if you prioritize younger populations, you reduce the incidence of infections relative to prioritizing older age group, but you have less of an effect on mortality. So your mortality goes up. So that's a trade-off that you make. Fewer infections overall relative, in a relative sense if you, if you vaccinate younger people, but a much more strong response on, on the part of mortality if you vaccinate older people. So that's, that's the result of this. And I want to tell you a little bit about now a more complicated version of that compartmental model that I just wrote down, which itself is a more complicated version of the SIR model that you heard about earlier. And this is called the INSISIM model. INSISIM because it comes from Indian scientists' response to COVID-19 simulation. This is a sort of compact term. I'll tell you a little bit about network models for testing after that. And I will tell you about Bharatsim in the next step. So the Indian, Indian scientist response to COVID-19, I'll tell you, I spent about 30 seconds talking about it because Kristen did talk about outreach and, and, and sort of public science movements. This is a group in which about 600 to 700 Indian scientists, basically from all fields, from medical, non-medical, physics, mathematics, biology, et cetera, are involved. This is a voluntary group that came together pretty much, I think, in February of last year. The modeling group had put out a whole bunch of different you know, reports that look at what might happen in Chennai, the impacts of the national lockdown, what happens as ways of exiting lockdowns. Can you, would you, a periodic lockdown scenario, would that be better in terms of bringing people back to work? These are the things that we did. We now have a much more complicated version called version 2.0 that's about to be released. Some of the results that I would tell you about come from version 2.0, although it isn't official yet. That's what the model looks like at the top. It's susceptible, exposed, then that splits up into pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic. If you're pre-symptomatic, you can be severely or mildly infected. If you're severely infected, you can go to hospital. There's a chance that you may die. And even within hospitals, you can subdivide this into people who will need ICUs versus people who won't need ICUs, ventilators, et cetera, et cetera. This is now nine compartments. 
it's defined at the level of every district in India. So that's that's 740 districts of India. It's age structured. It includes migration. So you can move from district to district. It has all of the contact structuring that I spoke about in the earlier example. You can even put in parameters that determine healthcare accessibility and the quality of healthcare variations across districts. There's a little tool that is also available publicly for people to play around with. This is a result that comes from the model. This is the city of Pune, a city of approximately 6 million people. And that's our prediction for the band in which we expected the number of cases who required hospitalization and potentially ventilation to lie in. So you can see that those dark spots there are the actual numbers of cases in hospital, critical cases in hospital. And the band is what we said, it's likely to stay within that. And so this is so we were, we did this in advance for about three to four weeks in advance. This was prediction on November 14, and by January 21st it was still kind of we sort of exited the band, came back a little bit. Into it. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the two about the points that you see that leave the band. You can see around 2020-08 that the, it sort of seems to be going up, then it comes back down, and there's a similar increase around 2020-09. The first increase is really has an interesting reason. The, the Pune municipality discovered that many people were in hospital, although they didn't need to be. They wouldn't count as proper critical cases. So they went to them and they sort of triaged those people who were already there and sent them back home if they felt that they didn't need hospitalization. That's where it actually dropped back into the band that we had. So that's an interesting sort of you know, playoff between modeling as well as real life. And you can sort of ask which came first was the model of the real life situation, which should be trusted in this particular context. This, these are numbers, again, as I said, from version 2.0 for Mumbai, another big Indian city, for a population of about 18 million or so, depending on how you count it. You can see the sort of successive peaks and troughs. That's the daily deaths that we predicted. That's the band of, 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 of infected that we predicted. These are sort of, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I use prediction a little bit um, you know, loosely. This is also retrospective. And these are codes that try to fit the data as well as you can going backward. And then at this point, then you can look at it two weeks in advance or three weeks in advance and keep refining it as it appears. But now the idea that what we're working on is to extend the model, the first model that you told you about, to take incisum and give it all of these additional vaccinated compartments, the vaccinated exposed, the vaccinated asymptomatic, and use the whole machinery that we've now constructed for this more complicated incisum model to try and ask what does vaccination do in terms of reducing disease severity? Can we put that in? Can we put in new variants and what they might do? Again, a great concern in the US, great concern in Brazil, certainly. Less of a concern as far as we know now in India, most of the variants seem to be homegrown variants, although we don't have much of an idea about how, what impact they have on, on severity of disease. And, but of course, for a lot of this, we need better clinical input. What exactly are the branching between the pre-symptomatic and, and the mildly and, and, and severely infected, etc. in an Indian context? We have numbers from Italy, we have numbers from the US, from China, from Europe, etc. But we don't have enough numbers from India to be able to systematically look at models such as this and ask and query them for these, asking these questions. I'll tell you a little bit about the network models for testing that we've been working on. And this is, again, very peculiar to the Indian context. India has two types of tests. One is a medium accuracy test, whose principal advantage is that it's inexpensive and point of care. This is called an RAT test or a rapid antigen test. And this, this is, is together with the high accuracy test, which is the RT-PCR with sensitivities and specificities under lab conditions of approximately 98-99%. The questions here are, how much do you test? What's the right mix of tests? And especially from an economic point of view, if you have states, rich states and poor states, the first states are sort of automatically incentivized to go for the for a larger fraction of RAT tests because they're just cheaper than the, than the PCRs. And the question is, if can you compensate for the fact that the RAT test is a worse test than the PCR test simply by testing more? And can you put in the number that you know about the sensitivity of these tests and also question the priority? Who do you test in the first place? So this is again, this is the paper that we wrote recently. And this is the structure of the model. It's a network model there are homes in it and people in tracking homes and you choose people of different family sizes all the way from one person two people in homes to about 14 people homes with a mean at about four people per, per, per family people go to work come back to home they can go to hospital they can infect healthcare workers in hospitals and you can ask how did the disease spread using the same sort of, 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 of model that were described earlier across this network and ask specific network type questions on this and you can ask, so, so these pictures on the top are really the results of what we do with different types of tests. There's a 
RT test with a 91% sensitivity. There's a German RAT test with a 74% sensitivity. The Indian RATs are somewhere possibly between about 60 to 70% as far as we know. And you can look at the fraction of RAT, the sensitivity of the RAT, and as a function of how much you test, are you testing 0.1% of the population daily versus 0.5% of the population? How much of a dent do you make in terms of the total number of people infected at the end of the pandemic? These are questions that we can now ask, and we can also put in the economic component into this. And that's what we've been doing. And it turns out that the mix of tests is relatively unimportant, provided that you test more. And you should certainly be testing around eight to 10 times more than you are currently. This is currently possible. Testing in India has plateaued a little bit from it's about half of what it used to be at its peak. And there's no real reason why we couldn't go back to a number comparable to that. We are extending these models to look at, in particular, to look at schools. If you have families, a community interacting with schools where children go to school, they're in different classes, and then you can ask, what impact does that have on the community itself? So age stratifying the model, the network model, looking at the interaction with models of a model community with schools to which children go to. These are questions that we're actually looking at. And age-dependent contact become very important in this context. The last thing I'll tell you about very quickly is Bharat Sam. And this is an ongoing collaboration between Ashoka University, which is where I work, and ThoughtWorks, which is a large IT company. And Bharat Sim is just an ultra large scale simulation of agents. And people who think about agent based models will understand what this terminology means. An agent is just a computational way of simulating a person with a specified minimal set of attributes. You can specify where they stay, where they work, how they interact, and the network that they have both at home and at work, etc. And then you can ask how does disease spread? The difference between the pure network model and, and, and the agent based model of this type is that you can embed it in a geographical context where you can have workplaces and areas that are geographically separate. And then you can ask, are there different hotspots within cities where you see the disease spread faster? What might lead to that? And, and can you simulate, in a sense, the real dynamics of, 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 a, of, of, a, of an infectious disease in a city in terms of a model such as this? So the most important part of this is not really the computation of the agent-based model. It's the construction of the right synthetic population. And for that, you need to integrate a whole number of different data sources and surveys, including gender, age, family sizes, socioeconomic data, healthcare access, et cetera. I work with computer scientists at Ashoka, use machine learning and AI methods to synthesize distributions such as these using these adversarial networks. And the aim is to, to really construct a synthetic population whose properties are indistinguishable from survey data. And we use a whole bunch of different Indian survey data to accomplish this, to incorporate all of this together. And the hope is to improve this later by using data from other surveys. And here we can actually hope to test multiple vaccine strategies at a much more granular resolution and really look at comorbidities, look at different socioeconomic attributes of, of how, look at choices, the nature of the choices that people make to be vaccinated or not. All of these you can do in agent-based models in a much more sort of interesting way, in, albeit with a lot of, of, of complexity on the computing side. And, but it, it, in a sense, these are probably the most accurate and the most granular models that you can think about for, for how diseases might spread. So that's what I've told you about. I told you about epidemiological compartmental models for vaccinations, including the model called Incisin that we've been working on. I told you about network models for testing, and now which are being adapted to look at vaccination and vaccination policies. And I told you about this large picture that we have of, of trying to create an agent-based model for India, on which we can ask you know, non-COVID-19 questions as well. And there's a lot of interest from, from a lot of people who work in public health to try and understand, can we use models such as these to make much more specific um, you know, to have much more specific discussions about the role of policy in understanding health in infectious diseases as well as non-infectious diseases. As always, all of this work is done with a large group of people. They're listed here, and I thank all of them. And let me thank you for your patience. Thank you, Gautam. That was um, indeed a wonderful talk. So, I mean, a lot of work, work covered, and there are questions. I'm sure uh, more questions would, would pour in. I, I personally have some questions. and. Um, but in the interest of time, I will move on to our next speaker, um, who is another decorated uh, scientist from um, India, uh, Professor Shahid Jamil. So Professor Shahid Jamil, for those who are in India, I think Professor Shahid Jamil does not need an introduction, but um, he is the director for director of Trivedi School of uh, Biosciences at Ashoka University, prior to which he was uh, the chief executive officer of the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance. So Professor Shahid Jamil is a leading voice in vaccines. Um, he's a virologist, so um, a lot of experience, over about 25 years of experience working with, with viruses, especially the uh, hepatitis E virus and HIV. 
and um, um, he he has been awarded again. I think uh, all the um, uh, all the important um, awards that uh, science in India has to confer, including the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. But most importantly, um, I have been uh, very much excited about the way he is communicating all the in-depth details of um, um, of vaccines and virus mutations and variants to uh, to to to. To the public, so very excited to hear about uh, your opinions, uh, Professor Jamil, and I welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tab. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me just uh, share my slides and get going. I guess you can see my slides. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so. Uh, a disclaimer, uh, I'm not a modeler, and I really don't know what I'm doing here. But, you know, hey, you know, Saturday night past 10 p.m., it's always a good time to learn something new. Uh, so I'm going to basically review uh, COVID-19 in India uh, and ask, uh, really ask questions about the predictive models that we have seen say a little bit about variants and then ask a few more questions about variants. And uh, finally talk about this uh, uh, adverse event following immunization reporting, the way it's happening in the country and tell you about a personal experience. All right, so uh, we know what we're seeing in the world and that's from Worldometer. So that you go and look at it on a daily basis. Uh, but I'm more keen to see what's happening here in India. And if you see what's happening here is that over the past one month, the number of cases are on an upward trend. And this is the whole country. Uh, there are six states which are really putting out almost 85 to 90% of the increase that we are seeing. Uh, so we went uh, around mid-February was the lowest point when the country was reporting roughly 11,000 uh, cases per day. And now on a seven day average, we are reporting about 20,000 per day. Uh, what is this due to? Uh, can we figure this out? Uh, that's really uh, important at this point. So a little more details, if you look at the breakdown across uh, five different states, you'll see that Maharashtra, which has really been uh, the state that has consistently led in the number of cases, uh, over the past one month, Maharashtra uh, has increased its daily load by three times. Uh, and so has the state of Haryana, although the numbers are are much lower here compared to here. Uh, Punjab is on an upward curve with roughly five times more cases uh, within the last six weeks. Uh, and uh, Delhi also, in fact, Delhi uh, has now gone up to about 400 cases uh, on, uh, on a daily basis. So this you have seen, but what's important is that uh, this increase, which on an average is about 28%, is not matched by the increase in daily tests that are happening. Those, uh, the, the increase there is only about 10%. Uh, ever since uh, mid-September, when our outbreak uh, really peaked, uh, this is really the first time that we are seeing the number of active cases go uh, uh, active cases on a daily basis uh, being uh, uh, going going up. So the number of recovered cases is uh, falling below the number of new cases on a daily basis, and that's uh, that's worrying uh, many people here. If you break across states, uh, uh, as you see, Maharashtra is really pulling the biggest numbers on a daily basis, uh, both in cases 
uh, as well as deaths, but Maharashtra uh, is not really testing as well as some some other states uh, on a on a daily basis. And uh, to this graph has been added uh, a column about vaccinated persons. As you may be aware, India started its vaccination on, I believe, 13th of January, but in the first two phases, uh, it's been healthcare workers and frontline workers. And only since the fifth of, uh, no, sorry, the first of this month, first of March, uh, India is vaccinating people who are 60 plus or people who are uh, below 55, but have uh, significant comorbidities. So uh, the vaccines uh, is that we are giving on a, on a country average is only about uh, 1.4 per 100 uh, people. Uh, and that's, that's really low at this point, and this, this needs to go up. So uh, India had uh, very pompously called a model, a super model. Uh, so here's the super model. Uh, and the super model has predicted reasonably well what happened on the upslope. But uh, uh, and the, the, the model has really not said anything about this increase that we are seeing now. And so from somebody who doesn't do modeling, from somebody who only looks at model to understand what's happening, the questions I have are the following. Is this uptick really behavior or are viral variants part of this? And the second question is how can models be improved? I can, I can tell you that uh, I have inside information on variants simply because uh, I chair the, uh, the sequencing consortium, uh, the scientific advisory group for the sequencing consortium. And uh, firstly, we're not yet sequencing enough. And where we are sequencing enough, we don't really, we, we do have variants, but we don't really yet see community transmission of those variants. So uh, I'm really, uh, quite surprised by this increase. And the only thing I can attribute this to at this time is uh, behavior. People have become lax, people uh, have just become, uh, uh, sort of have COVID fatigue. They also uh, think that now that the vaccine is here, uh, everything will be fine. So uh, I, I'm hoping that people uh, such as Gautam and, and his uh, colleagues are able to tell us at least uh, through some modeling perspectives why we may be seeing this. But I do agree with Gautam that uh, modelers uh, depend on data and that data on variants uh, uh, is, uh, is really lacking right now. Okay, so just a bit of biology about coronaviruses. I don't really need to remind you of this, that it's uh, Coronaviruses are RNA viruses with the, with the largest genome. And really the most important thing about this genome is uh, an exonucleus that is coded by this virus, which is very unique uh, for any RNA virus. And it is because of this error correcting function in the exonucleus that the rate of mutation of a coronavirus is one of the lowest in, uh, among RNA viruses. The virus uh, enters cells by binding to the receptor on the su surface of cells. And many of the mutations that we are seeing are really at the, at the binding interface of the spike protein shown in the red knobs here uh, with the ACE2 receptor, which is also uh, the region called the uh, receptor binding domain against which uh, antibodies uh, that are developed against this region are protective and are called neutralizing antibodies. So if you look at the genomic diversity uh, of the virus, uh, you know, it, it uh, mutates only, changes only about two or three nucleotides per month. So the question really is why are we seeing so many mutations? And the answer simply is that the world has uh, 
uh, a lot of uh, lot of infections uh, almost 120 million uh, infections cumulatively over the you know these are the infections we know of uh, we don't really know how many asymptomatic infections have been there uh, and uh, about which we we really know nothing about at this point so uh, a lot of mutations have developed and uh, many of the functional mutations are really in the spike protein over here. Now, uh, the virus as, it's, as it moved out of Wuhan uh, changed. Uh, so in early January, in, in sort of late January, early February, 2020, uh, the virus started changing uh, and the the original clade, which was called clade 19, shown in dark blue here, uh, mutated uh, a single amino acid change at position 617, uh, 614 led to uh, viruses that spread very rapidly. So all the other mutations that you're seeing in this clade 20 are really based on a background of uh, the 614 mutation. Uh, so at this point, roughly 99% of the virus that circulates is not the virus that came out of Wuhan, it's the, the change at the 614 position. And within this, you also see the UK variant lineage coming up, you see the South African variant lineage coming up and the Brazil uh, lineage coming up. Uh, shown on a radial map, uh, whatever is closest to the to the periphery is uh, what emerged uh, most recently, and you can see these three images. Now, if you talk about uh, the virus in India, well, the virus in India is no different from the virus circulating elsewhere in the world. Uh, there was this notion earlier because in India the mortality was about half of mortality seen uh, globally on an on average uh, there was this false narrative that the virus circulating in india is a less lethal virus uh, there's nothing like a less lethal or a more lethal virus uh, and this this essentially shows that the virus present in india is distributed exactly as the virus is distributed globally and here is the d614 uh, g mutation uh, it started changing in uh, late January, early February, and you see that uh, almost 99% of the virus that now circulates carries a glycine at position 614 in the spike protein instead of an aspartic acid. Now, what does this mutation do? Uh, well, one hypothesis that has been put forward by uh, a group based at uh, the National Institute for Biomedical Genomics in Kolkata, is that uh, this change from D to G creates an extra elastase site uh, in the spike protein. And this is very close to the S1-S2 junction. The cleavage of the S1-S2 junction is required for the virus to enter cells. So this uh, extra cleavage site makes it uh, more uh, amenable for the virus to enter cells and therefore uh, infect uh, uh, at, uh, at higher multiplicity and uh, produce higher viral loads. Uh, a, a review published recently has also looked at over 5,000 sequences that are available from India and have basically shown that there is a lot of mutation happening in the spike protein. And these are the mutations that you see. I mean, there are the N-terminal deletions, which uh, result in a loss of uh, spike gene reactivity in RT-PCR. Uh, so new primers essentially have to be developed. Uh, but see the number of mutations that are there in the receptor binding domain. Uh, thankfully, at this time, these are individual mutations. So separate mutations have not yet come together into any lineage, uh, but it, it's really only a matter of time. Uh, the prevailing hypothesis about development of lineages 
is that uh, people who have had, uh, you know, uh, who were immunocompromised in some way and had COVID infection for longer periods of time, the virus uh, in their body was able to mutate much longer than normally in an acute infection. Uh, in India also, we have used uh, plasma therapy quite generously. And most of the time, the plasma had not been tested for uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. So uh, we've given enough chance for the virus, enough selection pressure for the virus to, to mutate and to select uh, receptor binding domain mutations. So that's the story at this point. But if you look at uh, mutations and how they have emerged, how lineages have emerged, uh, I've just put India here as a comparison to uh, UK, US, South Africa, uh, Brazil. And I've added Turkey to this because in Turkey, there are multiple lineages that you see of the virus. So UK is essentially all now B117, which is uh, uh, the UK variant. In South Africa, it was pretty much everything, the South Africa variant or the B1351. Uh, uh, in India so far, we've discovered the UK lineage, but you will notice that uh, Unlike in UK or South Africa, uh, the, uh, the, the graph in India is, is rather sharp, which essentially says that uh, we don't really have enough sequences here to smoothen out these curves. Uh, and it will happen as, as we go along. So uh, various mutations have come together uh, in lineages. And if you look at uh, the V1, which is the UK variant, V2 is South Africa, and V3 is the, uh, is the Brazil uh, variant, you'll see that 614, of course, is present all across, but a key mutation has come up in South Africa and Brazil variants, which is the 484 mutation. Uh, and 501 is also something which is present across all three of these variants. Now, Importantly, if you map these mutations to the spike protein, you see that they firstly uh, are in the receptor binding domain, and they are in the region where the neutralizing antibodies bind to the spike protein. Uh, another mu mutation that has emerged primarily in California, which is called the L452R, uh, is also present uh, in the same sort of uh, place in the receptor binding domain. So there are, in India right now, we are seeing these as isolated mutations. Uh, but if more than one of these mutations start coming together and develop a lineage, then we will have the same problems as South Africa is having or as uh, uh, Brazil is having. Uh, so what really is the, the, the summary of neutralization studies that have been done so far, and people have done a lot of studies over the past uh, six weeks or so, mostly published uh, in MedArchive or BioArchive. Uh, this paper in New England Journal really summarizes it well, uh, which says that once mutations start coming together, when you have the full set of B, B1351, which is the South African variant, uh, mutations, then you, these viruses start evading antibodies. And uh, if I uh, may go back, you see that this is, this is the variant, the, the mutation 484K, uh, which is becoming uh, a border when it is present together with 501 or with 417, or especially if it is going to appear along with the 452 uh, mutation. Uh, in India, we have seen a lot of this mutation, N440, which is also in the same region. Almost 30% of the virus that has been sequenced from southern part of India carries this change. Now, uh, when will this mutation get together with the E484 mutation and maybe the N501 mutation, uh, only time and sequencing at very high density 
uh, will be able to tell us. Uh, INSACOG is the Indian SARS-CoV-2 consortium on genomics. Uh, this is the dashboard for, for, for the grouping. It has so far sequenced only about 5,800, close to 6,000 viruses uh, out of about 11 million infections in the country. So our sequencing rate is really low. But INSACOG, which is a consortium of 10 contributing institutes across the country, uh, aims to uh, really ramp up uh, sequencing and, and perhaps in some time in future go to about 5% uh, sequencing. Uh, in travelers, especially travelers from, from UK and, and US, we have been able to catch the UK variant shown here in blue, and also uh, a little bit of the South African variant shown here in green. And uh, the genomes have really come from different parts of the country. So uh, here is the situation in India right now. There are some mutations of concern. I told you that the N440K has been found in about 30% samples from Southern India. But another mutation, uh, which is not E484K, but E484Q, which is increasing in frequency in India. Uh, although uh, this is a change, it's not as drastic a change as converting uh, uh, an aspartic acid to a lysine. Uh, this is, uh, uh, sorry, a glutamic acid to, to uh, glutamine rather than converting glut glutamic acid to uh, lysine, a negative to a positive charge. So, uh, so far it's been single mutations which have not come together in any organized lineage, but variants of concern have been discovered from travelers. So, so far India has uh, discovered 188 UK variants. 157 of these are in people who had a history of travel or somebody who had contact with a traveler. However, 31 of these have been found in the community. Uh, and this is really so far found uh, from the city of Jodhpur in a, in a fairly close cluster. Uh, but we don't know how far it has spread further beyond that. Five South Africa variants and one Brazil variant has also been found by this grouping called INSACO. So my key question here is, uh, what would it take for key mutations to come together uh, in, into an Indian lineage? And is there some way we can predict that? Also, uh, is it possible to predict the sequence of appearing? So for example, if the first mutation that appears is N501, does it predispose the spike protein to also mutate the 484 residue or it becomes more difficult for 484 to mutate? What if 484 appears first? What does it predispose the spike protein to do? Uh, so that's really a question I have as a, as a virologist. Uh, if, uh, I wonder if uh, this is something that can be modeled because this will have implications on how a new lineage develops. And finally, let me come uh, very briefly to vaccines and the, uh, the adverse effects following immunization. So this is the, <clears throat> the dashboard for the uh, for the government's vaccination site called COVIN. Uh, and it's, it's very impressive. It tells you on a daily basis, uh, you know, uh, across the day from uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, you know, who took which vaccine, how many men got vaccinated, how many women got vaccinated, and all sorts of statistics. However, something which is completely missing from this is how many people had an adverse reaction to uh, the vaccine that was given to them. So uh, when you get your vaccine, you get a certificate like this. And on the certificate, beyond other things, including the photograph of our prime minister, there is a number here, which is a helpline number 1075. Uh, now, I had a chance to take 
uh, one vaccine, uh, and you know, it's not important to name which vaccine, uh, on the 5th of March. And uh, both my wife and I took the vaccine and exactly after 12 hours of taking the vaccine, around midnight, both of us developed chills and high fever. My wife's fever went to about 102.6. Uh, my fever went to about 101.3. Uh, with paracetamol, it would come down, but it kept going up and down for the next two days, next 48 hours, which was very unusual for uh, something like this, uh, you know, these vaccines that we've been told. Um, also, both of us had a lot of body ache. My ears were ringing. I, my head was bursting. And I had the worst kind of flu symptoms that you could have. I tried calling 1075. Uh, the guy who picked up, he was very polite but he did not have the foggiest idea of what an adverse reaction is. Uh, he gave me another number to call. I called that number six times, uh, out of which I connected only once. And at that time, no one picked it up. Uh, so this happened to somebody who knew much more than an average person. And this has been reported in the media. So India spent actually wrote an article uh, just a few days back on, on this, uh, that the data on adverse events is missing. And uh, this really becomes important because as you are aware, Covishield, uh, which is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine sold as Covishield in India, has been suspended from 10 European countries uh, because of reports of blood clot. Now, if you're not going to be recording adverse events, properly, uh, how are we going to even catch uh, the real bad uh, adverse events? Our fever went away in two days. Uh, the, the, the fatigue actually continues uh, still. Uh, so that's, that's the whole point. I mean, I complained to the Ministry of Health and, you know, the, you know, I got some calls and all of that, but it shouldn't have to be that. So really my question is, can we develop an effective reporting system for AEFI, a reporting system that will work and also a reporting system which will help build trust in the vaccines. India is not vaccinating at a rate at which it should be vaccinating. Uh, and it's a lot of it has to do with people not coming forward to, to get the vaccine. So I will just stop there and uh, happy to discuss any of this later. Thank you, Dr. Jameel. Um, indeed, I think uh, wonderful and lots of pertinent questions raised. Uh, you also ac actually raised a couple of questions that I had for both Christine and Gotham that how good are the models at predicting the recent uptake and up, up, uh, upswing that we are seeing in cases. But yes, I think, uh, um, I, uh, Rohan, would you like to read out the questions? How would you um, like to take this forward. I think you could introduce Pathchecks work so that it puts the questions in context um, and also uh, the, the path ahead. I would just like to uh, briefly mention here that the two of the things that you uh, just talked about, Professor Jamil, one about predicting variants. Um, would love to have your inputs. Our lab has been looking at some of that work using AI and the variance aspect, and and also using social media on looking at um, uh, adverse effects and hesitancy. So I think that's one direction that I clearly see uh, uh, we should be building together collaboratively on the same lines of how can we build better systems. But over to you, Rohan, if you would like to uh, um, ask the questions to the panelists. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tal, for uh, that. And thanks all speakers for giving your time and having this presentation. Uh, so we did have a few questions, and I believe a few of them were answered in the chats itself. Uh, but uh, one question was primarily for like uh, Professor Shahid Jamil. Uh, I believe it was from uh, Ramesh. He was looking at like, uh, could we have what is your inputs on having dashboards? Uh, which could which was which could meaningfully convey the effects of variants, uh, adverse reactions, symptoms reporting, etc. And uh, 
I believe uh, this comes from the context where Pachak has a vaccination dashboard, which talks, which is more from the US context and a few countries globally as well, uh, where we talk about like what is vaccines, which vaccines were received, uh, what is the percentage uh, supply demand gap, and what are the adverse reactions happening, um, stratified by age, gender, a uh, lot of other verticals as well. Uh, so we wanted your inputs more on uh, what would be an interpretable way of having such a dashboard and probably combine it with variance level information as well. Yeah, so if I if I may just quickly answer that, I mean, it's a great idea, but you will need raw data. And since uh, really it's the government system that controls the data, uh, you know, you realize that after February 26th, uh, the government of India's website doesn't say anything about adverse events. Earlier it was reporting it, at least giving the numbers, uh, but now even those have disappeared. Uh, and then, you know, the health planners worry why people have, are not coming forward to get vaccinated. So I think like Kristen said, uh, trust is so important. Uh, and this is possibly one of the most important lessons that we have learned over the past year. And it's, it's been emphasized again and again that pandemics are not just biological entities, they're social entities. And one of the most important things, ways to control pandemic is for people to believe in what you're telling them. So the level of trust is very, very important. Uh, it was there in lockdowns. It was there when migrants were, uh, you know, migrant workers were spreading across the country. Uh, it was there uh, when when vaccines were rolled out, the way vaccines were were approved. At every step, uh, you know, trust uh, has really been lacking. So the short answer is, if there is no data, how, how do you put a dashboard? Uh, yes, makes sense. Uh, I believe like there are a few places, maybe from the US context or like other places where there is uh, reportings made public. Uh, have you come across any such studies, peer reviewed venues, uh, where you've seen like uh, adverse reactions mentioned and its effects on variants or uh, like how like the vaccine is uh, effective against other variants. So I did come across few neutralization studies, but uh, have you seen such information being public, like whether the X XYZ vaccine would be effective against uh, the newer variants that are emerging, let's say in India, Brazil, or wherever? Well, there, there are some studies coming out now uh, and Unknowingly, actually, some uh, some results have come out. So, for example, the Novavax vaccine, which was which was just shown to have an efficacy of ninety six percent or something, when that vaccine was tested in South Africa, it showed only an efficacy of forty nine percent in South Africa, and the reason was simply that at that time, uh, South Africa was full of this this variant. Uh, so the, the vaccine is not neutralizing it very well. Uh, and that's where the 484K and the 501 have sort of come together. Uh, so there are some studies like that. And there are, there are also studies where people have actually taken uh, pseudoviruses expose them to uh, you know, suboptimal levels of neutralizing antibodies. And the results have shown that exactly the same variant, same mutations that you see in, in nature have developed in the Petri dish uh, when, you, when you challenge viruses with, uh, with suboptimal uh, concentrations of antibodies. So there is a lot of information coming out, definitely. I see, right, that makes sense. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Shahid uh, It was really wonderful. And uh, if there are other questions I can want to that, uh, I can start reading out. I think there is also a question for Christian, uh, which was more along uh, the 
the dynamic modeling of beta parameters. So I was wondering whether you used any sort of ML model data driven solution over there, or was it still a differential equation based method where you figured out uh, the beta dynamically? Yeah, so my model was a hybrid model. And um, so I used, uh, so actually for, for the X prize, and I'm working on more complicated ways of predicting beta, particularly for other countries, um, because my model worked much better in the US than in some other countries. Um, uh, I used just a simple linear regression uh, to, to intake uh, what, how beta would be adjusted uh, in terms of you know, school closings or policies. Um, so each day I fed in a new beta that was adjusted based on um, a regression model that was a priori made. Um, that, that could be uh, a fancier uh, algorithm than a linear regression. I, you know, um, that could be an LSTM model or, you know, something else that, that maybe would work better globally or for a particular country. So that's something to try. I'm, I'm writing paper right now. So I'm still working on that. Awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, looking forward to read that. Great. Uh, so I believe the other question was uh, for Professor Gautam. Uh, he had answered it on the chats, but still, if, he, if there is anything else you want to add. So the question was, are you seeing any difference based on your current simulations with the advent of variants uh, from the Indian context? Um, not specifically, because we don't put variants in, I mean, we could put in a variant as something that has a larger beta. So, but there's nothing that indicates that there was a sort of two coexisting values of beta with one significantly larger than the other in any of the work that we've been doing. We pointed out for a long time that there's a lot of India yet to be infected. That really, if you're anywhere near here, herd immunity is probably in the purely urban region of the city, in Bangalore, with Delhi, Bombay, etc., Calcutta. But much of rural India, there just aren't that many numbers. I mean, it's still about 20 to 30 percent away, at least, away from any reasonable estimate of 60 to 70 percent for herd immunity. So there are a large number of people to be infected, and you can account for this current surge in a sense by saying that it's just these. There's some complicated interplay between urban moving to rural and then rural coming back, movements of populations, et cetera, et cetera. Much of the surge that uh, Maharashtra has seen is not, not really in Bombay. It's also in Akola. It's in other regions that are a little more peripheral to, this, to the more urban regions in India. So if you ask me the real mystery, as I said in, in, in the reply, is why during the festival season in India, which is around November, we didn't see an increase. That would have been a very natural time, I think. There's hardly a modeler in India who didn't think that there would be an increase at that time. There's a tiny little blip, but it's so tiny that, you know, it could have just been in the noise. So, and, and this is tied to the fact, are we just missing cases where a young population, is it just that 80% of people are being asymptomatically infected? Is it spreading secretly through the country and across states that have younger populations that are not well served medically? And the only point you actually notice it is when it comes back to the cities, and then you happen to pick it up because people, you know, there's just a little more, a stronger tradition of reporting in a few city, in a few major states in India, which are precisely the ones that are reporting larger numbers now. So it's all very complicated. As you know, there's a lot of social, social factors involved. There's a lot of inconsistencies in testing, reporting, the nature of tests, variations in that. And sort of put all this together really seems very hard at this point. So I have no, okay, the summary is I have no clear answer to that question. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you, thank you. But yeah, uh, what if, if you, you said just, makes sense. Yeah, uh, Ron, yeah if, Ramesh, you can, if you can just add to that, uh, mm -hmm. I think put them your comments and, and Shahid, you know, fantastic talks um, all here. But the, 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 the broader comment here, which is, you know, for myself as a computer scientist, is, is uh, kind of baffling is that on one hand, we have data, uh, but we're not able to predict. Uh, and when we do have concrete data, like, you know, like occupancy of, you know, uh, COVID hospitals, for example, or deaths, those are pretty concrete data. Even if we don't have input data, we have the output data. Uh, and we're not able to kind of fit the some kind of regression and fit a model that says, okay, if this is, this is, the, this is the, you know, deaths and hospitalizations I'm seeing, you know, this is what it must be happening 14 days ago or, you know, 28 days ago uh, from it. 
So is it, why, why is that? Like on one hand, we have no data, like you said. On the other hand, we do have data. And so what are we failing as computer scientists and epidemiologists and, and researchers and planners? I can answer part of that, maybe Shahid can answer I think Kristen had her hand, hand up. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Kristen, sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sure. So actually, I think we can do that. Um, I think that is what my model was doing, was using excess death rates um, and zero prevalence, at least in the US, to estimate the true number of cases, including the asymptomatic cases. And, and that's really what we need to do. And I think it's, it's possible and it's being done. Um, I'm not sure if there's the US, I'm not sure if there's additional layers of complication. Um, I, I would need specifically to look at the specific regions where there's this question, but you know, the reason why I think in New York, it's one of two things going on. It's either um, reinfections because we know of the original variant, because we know other coronaviruses, you start to see reinfections at one to three years. So this could be just immunity waning from the original infections, or it's these new variants, which I think, you know, is quite likely. And the reason I know that is because accounting for asymptomatic cases, we're up over 100%. And it, if you're at that number of previous infections, you shouldn't see cases leveling off or not going down or spiking um, based on exactly what, what you were talking about. Um, Very true. Before Gautam adds, I just want to kind of, uh, you know, also kind of just express my kind of, you know, uh, kind of anxiety, which is the you know, the background death rates based on baselines also seem like a very broad statistical measure. Like, for example, in the UK, we have fewer deaths in 2020 than deaths five years ago, you know. Uh, so even the baseline doesn't make sense because we have fewer deaths in the middle of COVID than otherwise. So let me just point out what we've been seeing. Go ahead, Gautam. Um, so whichever way we model it, we sort of seem to see that there's a, the undercounting factors for deaths are probably somewhere between a factor of two to four would be our best guess. And we're undercounting cases by a factor somewhere between 10 and, and a factor of 30 at best. So there's already severe undercounting that goes in. The other fact that you should remember is that in India, about even though about 80% of, of deaths are recorded in best case, we have a medically certified cause of death only in 20% of that 18 of that 80%. So only in about 17 to 80% of the cases of all deaths do we know what an assigned cause of death was. So this is some indication that we're of the level of undercounting of actual COVID-19 deaths. That in a sense has to go into the model if you want sort of. So you're undercounting cases, you're undercounting deaths, you don't know by how much you're undercounting them. Your testing is, is kind of patchy and has been changing with time. And the tests have been changing with time. So this was, so that's one end of it. If you look at just serology, if you look at serology across the state of Karnataka, there's a government of Karnataka set of serology, uh, serological survey between the 1st and 16th of September that said that around 26% of Karnataka had been infected by then. Between the 15th and the 30th of August, there was another survey conducted by the Center for the Monitoring of Indian Economy and a bunch of, of US-based collaborators that came to a number of 40%. Now it's hard to bridge a gap between 25% and 40%. And so which is the right survey? What do you benchmark to? Becomes the question. Because if you said that, look, I'm going to trust the zero survey number and I'm going to match my predictions to that zero survey number and everything else will follow. But now, which number do you, would you put in these uh, bars on these are very large? They're not the same test. So, how do you compare zero survey results across different tests? They're not the same population. So, these are all the big question marks that we're struggling with at this point. And, you know, it, it would have been nice if we had a clearer understanding of this because then we would know what there is to explain. But right now, even the data that we're inputting into the model is at some level suspect. And it's just a sort of best case version that we can think about what seems reasonable, but this could be wrong. But... Fascinating. Yeah, so, I mean, I think one thing about the deaths is, um, so there's a lot of tracking of excess mortalities, which is just the amount of deaths that happen in a year above normal for a previous year. And so when you look at this, this is a New York Times data tracker. Um, so 
in New York City, we know that there, there are 60% more deaths in, in last spring than there have been in previous years. So those are not entirely attributed to COVID. Some of those are downstream effects, like people not seeking hospital, hospital care. But you can have a ballpark idea of how many true deaths there were. You also have to take into account age and comorbidities because that changes the death rate. But if you combine that with zero prevalence, uh, you start to narrow down on what the true number of uh, infections are. And, and I think um, like uh, Dr. Menon was, you were saying in your talk, um, you can go back in time and um, look at being able to predict what happened in the past um, and use that to be sure of your parameters. So um, you can tell that the true number of, of asymptomatic cases you have is the right number just by being able to prove uh, past predictions. May I ask a question? And uh, I will not, it'll be a short question, I think. So I know we are that, we are that, we are that we are running actually 30 minutes uh, behind time, but I would just ask a small question to, uh, to Gotham and Christine. So, so Gotham with these 1 million to 10 million agent based simulations going forward. So do you think that some of these issues that you pointed, which are, as, as Ramesh said, are fascinating, very complex behavioral effects, uh, testing effects. How much of that do you think is tractable? And what should be the way forward building better systems for maybe the pandemics that may come next so that um, these systems can help um, policy making I mean, uh, in, a, in a better manner. So uh, I, I think I just gave up uh, some of these modeling because, um, because of the reason that I, it, it, didn't, it just didn't make any more sense to me, any further sense to me after a certain point of time. So do you think that, um, that adding more agents or behaviors is, is the path forward? Or is there a way that we can abstract some of these very complex challenges to some simple um, aspects to, uh, to guide modeling? That's a great question. I mean, I personally think that agent-based models are the way to go forward because they can really put in variation at the level of the individual which you can't do in pretty much any other method because you sort of smooth all of that out. The other feature about um, both with H1N1 as well as with, with, with SARS-CoV-2 is this, this fact, this uh, 80 20 rule that a small number of people are responsible for a large number of disease events, the super spreader idea. It's, in, it's practically impossible to put, to put in super spreaders in any traditional epidemiological model. You can do it in networks, but then you're putting in information about network structure. So the only somewhat you know, the distanced way of putting this information in about super spreaders is to do it with agents. And then you can ask many more questions about the e economic impacts, how people respond, because the idea of the agent is an agent is something that can change its behavior based on input. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's an interesting computational object to work with for people who think about these things. So I would personally think that agents are the way to go forward. I think now competition has reached a level at which it's possible to simulate large cities, entire states, potentially even entire countries. And we should begin to think along these lines and see how far we can go. With them. That would be my, my perspective. Thank you, Gautam. That was a great answer. And I think, yeah, so uh, we caught the end of the time. We apologize for the uh, for overshooting the time and um, would like to thank all of you again, especially the panelists and great questions, great, uh, great thoughts put out. Uh, would look forward to more engagement with you, Professor Gautam, Christine, Professor Shai Jamil, uh, going forward in this um, uh, on, on building solutions together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.